in the last vid, we saw a geometrical proof that root 2 is irrational. Now, you would think that such a proof was known to the ancients. After all, it was geometry. But actually, it was not an ancient proof. It was by none other than Tom Apostol. Now, Tom Apostol was a very great writer of mathematics textbooks. He wrote books on calculus, analysis, and number theory. And I remember one book was really phenomenal. It was called uh, Dirichlet Series and Modular Forms or something like that. It was about Ramanujan's circle method, Hardy Ramanujan's circle method. Really amazing book. So Tom Apostol is a great writer. If you can get your hands on his books, just get them and read them. Now, Apostol's proof is very similar to one by Stanley Tenenbaum, uh, which was an earlier proof. Tenenbaum's proof is, you know, in, on its own is really interesting also. And why is that? Well, you can see how irrational numbers work. And I put quotes around work. You can see how they work in some uh, intuitive way. Also, you can see why the infinite descent becomes impossible. In, uh, in Apostol's proof, it wasn't entirely clear. Like, um, well, I mean, the proof is clear. We know it's impossible. But exactly what happens to make it impossible, well, we don't know. Uh, but in Tenenbaum's proof, it becomes uh, very, very clear. And so uh, it gives insight into the nature of proof by contradiction and infinite descent. And I'm going to explore uh, this angle here in this video. All right, let's get on with it. Uh, okay, so let's uh, suppose, like usual, square root 2 is rational, and we'll show that this leads to impossible problems. So uh, m over n is root 2, uh, and m and n are natural numbers. So m squared is 2n squared, very important. We have to remember this. And we begin with a construction. So if we have these two numbers, m and n, it should be possible to uh, draw two squares where the big one is the larger integer, which has got to be m. So this has side length m. And the little one, the blue one, is n. So this is very important. This is the basic way the Tannenbaum construction begins. And let's not forget, this is n squared area. And the outer black one is area m squared. So I wrote that down here. Let's remember that. And the relationship between them is uh, the outer square is two times the area of the inner square. So we're going to see that assuming uh, that these are integer uh, length, side lengths is going to cause uh, the contradiction. Now let's place another blue square. So here was my first blue square. I'll trace that out like that. And I've put another one here. Let's do that in a different color. All right. And when I do this, I get a square in the middle, like so. So I put two of these n by n squares inside my big square. So my question is, what are the dimensions of these smaller squares inside? So, all right, this is m, and this is length from here to here. We remember this is length n. So this must be m minus n. So this square here has side length m minus n. Now call this x. This is going to be m minus n over here. So I get this equation and that. And now it's easy to solve for x. x is 2n minus m. Very good. So now I can write it like this, 2n minus m. So this area here is m minus n all squared. And this area here is 2n minus m all squared, like this. And same here, this is m minus n all squared here. I'm going to give them some names. Let's call this bigger square capital M and this little smaller square capital N. So what is the area of capital M over the area of capital N? Okay, that is 
like so. Okay, so we can expand all of that. We get this and now, now, now we use what we know from before. M squared is 2n squared. So we use that area relationship, the original one. That allows some magic to happen. I, uh, I get this here, this uh, fraction here, and this simplifies to simply 2. Now that's pretty amazing. Let's give this some names. Let's call this m prime. And this, okay, so from here to here is m prime. And now let me try a different color here. From here to here, okay, well, yeah. From here to here, that's n prime. So what we've proved is that m prime squared is 2 times n prime squared. Very interesting. Okay, so we see that the proportions of this big middle square area to the smaller square on the edge is exactly like the original Tenenbaum construction, uh, the big outer square. Okay, it's the same thing, big outer square M with smaller inner square N. Okay, the same proportion like this. This one satisfies exactly the same thing. And what does that mean? It means that I can now take this square and put it here like so. It's getting kind of a messy drawing, but I'll fix it soon. I'll take this one and put it here like so, and I'll get the same thing all over again, but smaller. Okay, so let me write that down, what we've discovered. So I can put two of these smaller capital N squares into the bigger capital M square in the middle here. That's what we've discovered in exactly the same way with exactly the same proportions as the first set. Okay, let's do that and see what that looks like. Let me show you what I've done here. I've taken this square, the one in yellow, and I've put a copy over here like so. You get it? And then I take this other square and I put a copy over here like so. You see? So this gives me a carbon copy of the Tannenbaum construction but smaller. The original construction had dimensions m and n where m squared is 2n squared. But now we have the smaller version here, m prime uh, from here to here, and n prime, which is from here to here, and m prime squared is 2n prime squared. So it's exactly the same Tannenbaum construction, only smaller. And in fact, we can give some more labels. This is going to be m prime prime, and this here is n prime prime. And we have a sequence. m is greater than m prime, and that's greater than m prime prime. You could see it geometrically, they're and all greater than zero. Same for the n's, it's a sequence which is all greater than zero and strictly decreasing. It's obvious from geometry. But, you know, however convincing geometry is, there's always somebody who's going to say, ah, I don't buy it. So why don't you do as an exercise, uh, prove these things by algebra. It's uh, similar to what we did um, in the previous video, but there's some in interesting possibilities here because the construction is different, so you can use the different kind of arguments. Okay, let's keep going with this. It's clear that if I have this relationship, m kth iteration uh, is equal to 2 n kth iteration. If all of the iterations have this relationship, then I can produce the next iteration, and I can go on and on and on and on, on and on. Okay, so I start with m, m prime. This is m prime prime, m prime prime prime. <laughs> and this is uh, n, and this is n prime, and this is n prime prime, and this is, here is n prime prime prime, and so on. So I get these two infinite sequences, uh, uh, and they have the following properties. They're infinite sequences of strictly decreasing natural numbers, so they're positive, and they're not beginning at infinity. These are finite numbers. 
And so this is impossible. So I can say the following, that this is the infinite descent contradiction, and this must mean that root 2 is not in fact in Q, because that's what causes the problem to begin with. All right, that's very interesting. Let's see what else we can get out of the Tenenbaum construction. Now, there are mathematically inclined people who find this kind of proof by contradiction, infinite descent to be somewhat dubious. They have trouble believing what's going on here. And I think maybe what they have in mind is something like this. I'm going to choose the M and N that I want, some integers, and I'm, I'm going to keep iterating this construction. Who's going to stop me from doing it, you know, all the, as far as I want? Like, is some mysterious ghostly hand going to stop me? I'm going to just keep going. I know that the proof says I, can, I can't do it uh, up to beyond some point, but who's going to stop me? Well, is this correct? Is some mysterious ghostly hand going to stop me? And here's my answer. Yes. <laughs> yes, it will. Okay, so let's think about this. If uh, m over n is exactly root 2, then the Tenenbaum construction goes on forever. There should be no problem believing that. But if m over n is not exactly 2, maybe it's near root 2, but not exactly root 2, then, then the Tenenbaum proof says the construction will have to fail at some point. It doesn't go on forever. So it doesn't say how it will fail, but it will fail. So yes, the ghostly hand is going to stop you from making this construction uh, to an arbitrary number of steps in part b here, in case b. And with the Tenenbaum construction, we can see this happening here in B, the fail, the ghostly hand. We can see it, how it works. Uh, it's much clearer than uh, in other proofs. So let's do just that. There are two ways for the Tenenbaum construction to fail, for it to become impossible. One way is when uh, M over N is too large, and the other way is when m over n is too small. And each of these ways leads to a different mode of failure. Let's look at way one. When m over n is equal to 3 halves, it's pathological. And when it's uh, greater than 3 halves, it becomes impossible to continue the construction. This is what happens when m over n is exactly 3 halves. These three squares are exactly the same. And so it's not possible to keep uh, making a decreasing sequence. And now here, uh, m over n is greater than 3 halves, and we see the Tenenbaum construction becomes impossible to continue because my uh, n square here, my n square is bigger <laughs> than my m square, you see. So it's impossible. So this is one way it can derail. Let's look at another way it can derail. And that happens when m over n is less than or equal to 4 thirds. Things get pathological at exactly 4 thirds and then impossible be before that, below that. Here's the situation when m over n is exactly 4 thirds. This square here the, um, is the m prime square. This is too big because when I try to fit this uh, smaller square in here, um, they don't touch or they don't overlap. Okay. Here I fit them in. I took this smaller square and put it in here. Let's color that to see what's going on. You see, they don't overlap to form another smaller square. There's, so there's no way for me to continue this construction. It's just a dot now. Okay. And uh, it, when m is less than, strictly less than 4 thirds, let's see what happens. Here, here, m over n. Let's get my color back. m over n is less than 4 thirds. You see the black square is way too big. They don't even touch 
in in here. They don't overlap at all, the two smaller squares. And so there's no way for me to continue the construction. All right, so what I did was I did some computer programs that check the following conditions. First of all, m over n has to be greater than or equal to 4 thirds, and then it has to be less than or equal to 3 halves. So I check this condition, and I check this condition, and I see which one is violated, which one does the ghostly hand uh, come, come and reach out and then prevent me from continuing. Here I've taken a reasonable, rational uh, approximation for root 2, 577 over 408, and I compute m and m prime, n prime, m prime, prime, n prime, prime, and so on by computer pro program, and then I check those conditions, and let's see what we get. Wow, it doesn't take long for the wheels to come off the wagon here. It fails on the condition of having to be less than two-thirds, and that's on the sixth step. So it starts off quite close to root two here, but uh, it deviates rapidly, then jumps off to infinity, fails, and then everything else fails because it goes to negative. And it's interesting that it's going to negative root two over here. That's very interesting. Okay, let's try uh, another one. This one is a much better rational approximation. Let's see what happens now. Well, it takes longer for it to fail, but it does fail this time on, what is this step here? On the 18th step, it fails the condition of having to be less than two thirds. And again, everything else fails. And you see it's starting to go towards uh, minus root two as we go along. So we're very close to root two at the beginning and it rapidly deviates away. And that's amazing. So the ghostly hand did come out and get you here, right here. All right, one last one. Let's give this a shot. I'm going to take m over n to be a floating point number, uh, float 64. So that's about 15 to 16 digits of accuracy. And this is the best I can do uh, with a normal computer program without having to use big floats and things like that. Let's see what happens now. It lasted longer, but not that much longer. The wheels came off the wagon on step 20. I merrily tried to do these constructions and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I'll show you. I'm gonna go all the way to infinity, but no, the ghostly hand stopped me at, and, and it derailed my construction just like, I thought it would. Well, that was very enlightening and very interesting. I like very much how the Tenenbaum proof proves that something is going to go wrong, but doesn't tell you what. And the further investigation kind of shows you what is going wrong. Like here, for example, right there. So if you like this vid, click like, leave a comment. And of course, subscribe because more math videos are coming. And I will see you next time.